would you like to introduce yourself and who wants to start? Well, if it's just a quick introduction, I'll start. I'm Serena Hazard. I'm a painter and um, I have, um, I went to art school and I, in my late twenties, then I did life. I was always making, but it wasn't until about maybe, well, 15 years ago that I had this epiphany of, on a walk that said, so pick two things that you want to do in your life and everything else is a distraction. And what came out of my mouth before I even thought about it was, I have to paint. And that's kind of how I am gotten where I am was just, it, it like grabbed me. It's not like, I, I don't feel like I chose it. I feel like it was in me, it came in me and it's saying, yo, <laughs> please use me while you're here. So here I am. And that's more or less 15 years ago, you said? Is that what I heard? Yeah, it was about, yeah, let's see, 2007, somewhere in there, so 13, 15 years ago. I mean, I was always working, but, uh, I mean, painting, but this was, this was like, you know, you have to actually really show up for your work and do the hard stuff. Was there anything in your career before that, 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 you know, that you already had an inkling to painting? Did you try other mediums or, you know? Well, yeah, I, and that's one of the things that I feel like is a, has, is this sort of really humble and kind of simple mystery. Everything I've done in my life is serving me now. I was a builder. I was a textile designer. Uh, I renovated houses. I design patterns for fabrics and tiles. I uh, raised a kid and learned how to have, you know, boundaries and humility and, and uh, consistence and persistence. A tough marriage, learned a whole lot about myself. All those things ended up being incredibly beautiful, compost in my soul as an artist and it's that's what i'm that's where the seeds are planted thank you thank you serena after that. Oh, that's a dog that's uh marcia i, I muted her so who, wants to go yeah, mute. <laughs> who wants to go next sandra tell me a little bit about yourself <laughs> Um, Sandra Spidell. Um, I am an oil painter, uh, figurative and abstract. Um, I, I guess I think of myself mostly as a figurative painter. I teach at the Academy of Art. I teach uh, both, both figure drawing. Um, and I, I've taught there for a long time ever since I went to school there. So. Um, I think I want Serena's life. I think I want the, I want to do all those things she did. But uh, I mean, I did start late, so I guess I, I did some things before that. But um, I went to the Academy of Art, and then I taught right out of it. And I still teach there, still teach uh, code figure drawing. Um, so I'm trained classically in drawing and painting. And um, I started off as an illustrator. And I like to um, I, I like to joke that I am a recovering illustrator um, because it, you know illustration is uh, it's communication, but it's very literal communication, and that's just not me. So, although I spent a number of years doing that and you know raised my daughter and, and uh, made a living, um, about 20 years ago. Um, the whole industry changed anyway with computers. So um, I decided I was going to paint. Uh, when I was illustrating, I was doing pastels. So about 20 years ago, I decided I was going to, uh, I was just going to paint. So I started doing like impressionism. And then um, eventually that wasn't satisfying either. So I moved into uh, what I do now, which is more abstract 
um, you know, less, less and less defined. And, and, and as I go, I get less and less defined. And um, so I, uh, when I paint figures, I, I love the figure so much that it's hard for me to completely let go of it. So I try to, uh, I work on abstracting it to the degree that I can without completely losing it. And I really admire people who almost completely lose it, simplify it so much you can barely tell it's a figure. But somehow I just love, I just love, uh, you know, those S curves and I love the, you know, that little hip bone and I, I just love that stuff and I have a hard time letting go any further than I am. But, um, yeah, so uh, one thing I've been doing is, uh, um, during, um, since the pandemic started is uh, Zoom um, figure drawing. And um, so that's been, that's been pretty interesting. Um, actually, you know, it has its advantages. You're in your house and you forget something, you run and get it or, or uh, you know, whatever. Um, so um, that's about it. Thank you. I hope you will never give me a figure because I love the figures in your, uh, in your, in your painting anyway. So. Oh, thank you. Beautiful combination. What about Sherry? Sherry, because you're in, on my screen, Sherry's right by Sandra, so I go that way. Um, so my, my art came through calligraphy. So I'm, I'm a painter now, but I, I say but my history is calligraphy and I actually learned calligraphy in high school and fell in love with it as soon as I tried it. So I studied calligraphy with some of the greatest masters and that became my life. I started teaching calligraphy straight out of college I do have a degree in art, um, mostly because I ended up taking more art classes than anything else and kind of fell into it that way, but loved it. And, um, and it wasn't until I met a, uh, my, my calligraphy teacher um, in 1986, who actually did painting with letters. And instead of doing words and all this stuff, he used letters as... Um, as the, uh, the main part of it. He was an abstract painter that used lettering as his subject. And that totally fascinated me and changed my life. And so since then I've been working first with his style until I sort of kind of got into my own work, uh, just gradually, everything has been a very gradual shift. And part of the breakthrough I had was in 2010 when I started writing poetry and I wrote poetry as a way to live a deeper life, a fuller life, and, and sort of created this um, setup where I would write twice a week and, and kind of call the spirits of dead poets to sit with me. And I felt like I had opened this gateway into this other world. And then my task was to keep that gateway open to bring it into my painting, which is who I felt I truly was or am. So I've been doing the uh, combination of, of poetry and painting, and it's not, I do not put the words into my poems, and my poems do not, and my paintings do not illustrate the poems, but there's this um, aliveness that happens when the two of each of the other finds each other. So when I do have a painting with a poem or a poem with a painting. So um, it keeps, everything keeps evolving. As Serena said earlier, like, like five months ago or five weeks ago even, um, things keep changing. And so I'm open for that change and that's what fascinates me. Yes, yeah. yeah. wonderful. Elizabeth, talking about calligraphy, maybe we can go over to you. <laughs> yeah, I did uh, actually people's wedding invitations for many years, <laughs> you know, filled in a lot of, uh, you know, corporate forms with calligraphy, that sort of thing. but. Um, mainly I've always been drawing ever since art school, uh, which was a very long time ago. Um, I went to a very small uh, school in Connecticut. Uh, it was actually originally an artist guild uh, silver mine in New Canaan, Connecticut. And for a little while it became a college and I went there. But I was very influenced there um, by my drawing teacher, um, a man named Barry Kahn, who had studied with Joseph Albers at Yale. And uh, he introduced me uh, to a very thoughtful way of drawing, uh, to line drawing, 
in a way that I hadn't thought of before. Um, and I think I've done that ever since, although mostly I've been growing trees. Um, but did about um, 11, 12 years ago, I came to California and uh, discovered colored pencil um, with Nina Ansa at uh, Sebastopol Center for the Arts. And uh, since I'd always been doing like flowers and trees and whatever, it was just sort of a natural progression uh, for me. And then as well, um, I had always been painting mostly in oils and started fooling around more and more with watercolor and got into doing collage with newspaper. Uh, so I do a lot of mixed media now as well. Um, and I love California. <laughs> it's inspirational here, right. even with the fires. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's we didn't choose for those fires. Yeah. Let me see a minute. So, um, so Marsha Connor, Marsha, yes. Well, let me, um, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. We'll, we'll see if we don't have the tree trimmers and the dog. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting to have a conversation with other artists and hear the places where you connect. So Elizabeth, my teachers at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, all came from Yale. Yep. And so it was a big Yale influence and um, studied with people like Albers. And so kind of like the lineage that people say in martial arts sometimes about where your lineage came from, that some of my lineage also came from that same place. Second, <laughs> next, <laughs> next generation. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and, and teachers who were very passionate about drawing and, pra and the practice of art making. And I had a teacher, Arnold Bittleman, who studied from um, Albers and other teachers at Yale, who was really one of my primary influences and who just loved drawing and mark making. And I've continued to incorporate that, I think, in many ways my whole life. And he said, if you chose the right things to draw, they would teach you how to draw. And, wow. and so that's really been my practice. That's been one of my sustaining mantras, I think, for a long time. And I have been an artist ever since I was a child in some ways. And um, I was encouraged. Uh, I can re remember, and I, so I grew up on the East Coast, but I came to California in 1974. But when I came to California, I was passionately involved in life drawing almost every day. And when I came to California, I continued that practice until we took the model outside in the landscape. And then I discovered the connections between the body and the landscape. And then the body sometimes gave way to the land. And The, um, and the practice and the practice of life drawing with the immediacy of it and the sense that there's a life underneath the skin and the bones that are there, the bones of the earth were shaping the land. On the East Coast, it was so covered with trees and green that I couldn't see the land so much as I could when I got to California. And um, that there's an immediacy and a practice that goes along with life drawing that has sustained me through painting, which is to sort of come in with gesture drawing, um, with contour drawing, um, with the things that get you acquainted with the subject and with a directness that is not a photographic way of working. It's a very much an embodied way of working. And, and my other interests have especially been dance and, and meditative practices like authentic movement. And um, I have also written poetry and done a body of work that is collages called Dream Vessel and, po and poems that are related to it. But as I said, as Sherry said, one wasn't intended to describe the other, but they are companions. And each one of them opened up something that was unexpected. And I've started writing again during the pandemic with um, a group of 
people that are assembling through San Francisco through Zoom, through a, a palliative care clinic that they say, isn't it wonderful that palliative care can be poetry? And, um, and so I've been an artist and, an, and a teacher, a professor. I've taught at the junior college for many, many years. I've recently been teaching at Sonoma State in a um, program that is for students who are completing their bachelor's degree in a hybrid class. But um, my hands-on part was, has been canceled for now. Um, and, and I approach working out in the landscape by being in the landscape in my body and, and embodying the things that are there um, so that I dance with the trees. I try to make things appear by how they grow. My brush strokes, like in the painting behind me, are grown rather than copied. They're kind of grown as the, as the grass grows. Um, Great. And so I've been a painter, a sculptor, a dancer, a poet, a collage maker. Sounds almost like a song, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so what I'm showing right now is, pa is paintings from, and this is from Pepperwood Preserve, where I've had a very strong relationship and brought lots of people out with me to the land to paint on plein air. I'm go we're going to go back to that in a second, because we haven't heard anything from Christy Marx yet if we can get her from her ghostly landscape. So Christy, you will have, you will have to unmute and then uh, we can listen to you. Okay, well, I don't know what's wrong, but that's a nice view of my studio. Um, all cleaned up because I was open uh, the past two weekends for the Savos um, walkthrough studios. And so I cleaned everything I disinfected everything, and now I'm looking forward to making an, a mess again. <laughs> um, what was the question? The question is exactly, so um, th talk a little bit about yourself. You know, when did you start uh, painting or, you know, what brought you to painting? Uh, you know, did, are you, wh what are you doing? Are you teaching? Are you a full-time painter? That type of relationship to, to what you're doing now. And then uh, remember, remember that Later on, we will go to your artwork. I will show for each of one, I will show what on Savas on the side. So just now it's introducing yourself. Okay, well, my name is Christy Marks. I am a native Californian and um, I've been living up here in Sonoma County since 2005. And I moved up here for a job with Kaiser Permanente. Um, I've always been in interior design and I moved here because I was um, hired by the project management team here in Santa Rosa to assist with the expansion of the Kaiser up here in Santa Rosa. And so I joined them in 2005 as an interior designer and I worked for them uh, until 2013. Um, during my time in design, I became more and more interested in the visual arts and <clears throat> started taking some of the materials that I work with in interior design um, and trying to do something else with them. So for example, in the design world at that particular time, everything was uh, getting to be green, green, recycled, uh, all of that kind of thing. And I used to present my project boards with brown paper bags to get across the idea of the recycling and, and the reused. So when I started to get more into visual art, I just kept using those bags and um, <clears throat> putting together small drawings and paintings, more or less in a collage um, uh, method. Through, through time, and especially over the last three years, I'm now adding a lot of painting into the mix. 
So I'm not exactly sure now if I called a mixed media artist or a painter because I really am combining both, but my heart is becoming more and more in painting. So um, that's, that's, that's what I do. I usually will produce a mixed media underpainting using the paper bags and layering materials and then over the top paint my primary subject matter. I'd say I'm kind of an abstract realist where the <laughs> background of the piece um, is interesting with the mixed media work, uh, but then the painting part, which is the subject, is more, it, it's becoming more and more the focal point of the piece. Great, well thank you. So. Um... We could go over to your work right away, or we'll go back to Serena, since we haven't heard her. And I will now share the screen and show Serena's work. And Serena, if you want to talk a little bit about it. So let me go and do that. Let's oh, this will be interesting. I wonder what I'll say. <laughs> Here we go. So these are the images that you're showing on the side. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about it. Uh-huh. Well, this uh, painting called The Old Woman Sheltered Her Joy is actually the first painting that I did when we were uh, put on to shut down, sheltered, and uh, totally surprised me, as uh, my work tends to, because I felt like there was joy, and I am always surprised that the opposite of uh, what I actually am feeling while I'm working in the studio is what actually comes through into the piece and is reflected back to the viewer. Um, I'm always shocked when people say, oh, there's so much beauty. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm in my studio going <laughs> And then this comes out. So there's a, a interesting process that I feel like is alchemical in a way. Um, and I tend to um, generally, uh, not generally, I, I don't know what, what is going to emerge in a piece. Um, I don't know where it's going. And I have, I was listening to Marsha talking and realizing that I have a, that I share something with you, which is that somatic experience of the physicality of painting. And that um, I'm just trying to become a better and better technician as a painter the way I will, a master gardener is. It's like I don't decide what that seed is going to actually become. I'm just going to learn how to grow it so that it gets to be as full as it's, it's meant to be and come to its fullness. Um, well, it's, a, it's a changed a lot since the first, the first years when I met you, you had landscape, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe you want to, ch is there anything you could talk about that, about how it changed or, you know, is it getting closer to your work? I don't know. So if you wanted to talk about that. Well, what's, what's uh, kind of curious to me is um, it's been over the last, I don't know, maybe four or five years in our trails. People have more and more said to me, you know, I don't really like abstract work, but I really like your work. And, and I look at my work and I go, what's abstract about it? Isn't that real to you? <laughs> and I realized that um, uh, I sort of, uh, um, Sandra, when you were talking about finding that edge of, of holding on to the human form, I feel that way with the landscape, that there's a certain um, need in my own nervous system to have some sense of vast distance, some sense of a way to get out of a painting, some sense of the intimacy. Um, I'm nearsighted. I've always got hair in my face. So I'm always like looking at things up close. and. So when I, and I, and I'm that way when I'm painting, like sometimes I'm just really up very close. So those, um, those aspects, uh, although they're becoming less and less literal, 
um, as I realized that, especially in, and this is like since January, well, the last three years, but culminating in January is, I know there's another way to live and how we're living. I can feel it in my being. And these paintings end up being like, almost like prayers to me of just like, I just want to call in that quality of humanity that knows beauty and knows joy. And even though I'm not particularly trying to make something beautiful or trying to bring, trying to paint with joy, I don't think about myself generally as a joyous person when I'm by myself in the studio. But I have this uh, soul kind of urgency of, um, uh, getting more and more fantastical in a sense, mm. in, in terms of, of bringing in, like, what's it, you know, bringing in these, uh, I don't know, these wild things. I know, and I noticed just recently, my work is shifting again, and it's actually getting much brighter. And I, it was a dark, this was a dark period of time for me. And this is all, you know, very textural. I paint, I scratch, there's joint compound underneath, it's dyed and, and then I end up building it up and building it up and then, you know, take my rotary sander and attack it when it starts to get too dead. And um, sometimes the paint is like a stain almost, it's all oil paint. And then sometimes it gets built up to the point where it's quite thick. And uh, I feel like I'm navigating this very narrow channel between chaos and um, something that is not uh, literal and concrete, but we rec I recognize it and, and somebody else recognizes it and goes, oh yeah, even though we can't quite name what it is. So, yeah. That's great. Uh, if anyone has a question about it from the artist, go for it. And I actually will now show, or unless there is a question from the, from the other artist. Otherwise, I think it's, it will be such a contrast, I think, to go to Sandra Spidell's work. You see. Oh yeah, here it is. So here we go. Sandra, this is your work. Yes. Well, little part of it, six pieces of it. I, and I know you have lots more work that right. would be seen. But um, would you like to talk a little bit about your, your process or your work? Why, or maybe even why you selected these ones? Uh, well, these are all recent. So um, all done in uh, 2020. So wow. um, <clears throat> um, let's look at that symphony. That, that one is, that one came about um, through the pandemic. And you can see there's a little, something came out as like a bird in the lower right. And that one little thing for me sort of pulls that painting together. It's just, it was, it's one of those accidental little images that, uh, a little higher. One of those, see that right there? Mm -hmm. it's one of those sort of accidental shapes that you just think, wow, if the whole thing was like that. But it's just, I just love that little piece. And so the rest of it, kind of answers that kind of there's a dialogue between that and the rest of the painting and um you know i think that in most of us in the pandemic it's hard when you're in history to talk about it and so i think it often like you don't even understand what you're putting together and so i couldn't explain this painting except that I, when I saw that little bird shape, I thought that's, 
that's what it's about it has something to do with flying away it has something to do with uh you know escaping um everything and and i was thinking about the color pink because i don't tend to paint in pink and i was thinking of it as a spiritual color um but again you know it, I, I think you do your best work when you're just immersed in it. You're not really thinking about it and it just moves in one direction or another. And if someone asks you why you put that bit of green or that bit of something or other in there, it's, it's, you can't explain it. You know, it's only, I, I mean, all, your training comes in, in in terms of balance and color and shape and all that. But, but, you know, I think the best, most authentic marks have to do with um, when you're not thinking, when you're not trying to produce something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, each of these has, you know, they're just uh, moments of, uh, like, like choices is, uh, I often paint my daughter and it, you know, and she moved away about five years ago, so I, I don't have I don't have so much access to her, but um, it's always interesting to watch a younger person making choices and then you realize that those choices become your life. And so that's what this painting is about is because, you know, she was looking for jobs and she was, you know, she had met her boyfriend and there's all kinds of things happening. And I thought, you know, one day you'll say, well, I did that, and then that led to that, and then that led to that, and, and, uh, and that's, that's what this painting is about. Um, so I usually get a, there's something I get a hold of that, that I, I can't paint it unless there's the emotional thing that I can get a hold of. And when I used to paint her a lot, I mean, I already had that connection, you know, no matter what situation she was in I could connect to that so these days I'm you know I search for imagery or something that you know um, that that I, I can feel emotionally mm. and if I can't feel it and that's that was my problem with illustration when I can't feel it you know if you just have to render something I just I almost can't do it I just I can't connect uh, to just the visual, it, there has to be other levels. And I think, you know, I think if I, if I had to say exactly what I do with figures, it's trying to, instead of the outside in, instead of the visual in, I'm trying to convey the inside out, like what's happening with this, even, you know, swimmer, like that, the feeling of it, the, the light, you know, the experience of being underwater uh you know just that whole thing and then how that metaphorically that being below the surface sort of suggests other uh psychological ideas and levels levels of meaning yeah i would like to quickly look also at petaloma hills uh -huh. because then we will here have a good look at petaloma hills and then we'll go to marcia connell with her landscape so thank you, Sandra. What I love, love, love about talking to you all is also to see how individual your style is. You know, there's, of course, there's common ground, but you all express it in such a different way. And uh, I want to show now Marsha's work. Thank you so much, Sandra. Very interesting. So here is Marsha's work. Marsha, can you hear us? But you are not, yes. you are... I'm yeah. now. Any reason why you selected these pieces for our Savos website or um, anything you would like to say? You already talked about the feeling of being part of the landscape, you know, being part of it. Yes. Well, I chose, I chose this group of work. Um, three of them are from Pepperwood Preserve, the Wildflower Heaven 2 and Summer Grasses, and the one in the middle on the bottom also, Bechtel House Perspective. And I've just spent a lot of time in the landscape, getting to know it by hiking it 
and sleeping there and climbing through it and talking to scientists and touching it and smelling it and bringing other people with me afterwards. But spending, I've spent a lot of time there alone and just taking in the piece of the landscape. And it's been a very special project for me um, that has been ongoing for a few years. And sometimes I get to just the absolute simplification of it, like the Bechtel House perspective is just those few shapes really tell the story of how things are when they're close and when they're distant and the texture you can almost kind of feel like you could put your hands through the grass or roll in it. At least as for me, well, I guess something that I think that they all show is that my engagement with the landscape is a contemporary kind. According to, I once heard somebody in a few years ago talk about how the interpretation of landscapes used to be this big grand vista that the East Coast painters did. They all went to the places that became national parks and made these grand vistas with maybe little teepees in them or things like that, or little um, Native American people walking in them. And, or they could be grand experiences that people paid just to see one painting. Um, and they were also kind of picture postcard kind of views and that he felt that a more contemporary kind of way of being in the landscape is so that you could feel like your toes are in it, that you're right submerged in it. You're not distant and apart from it. You're part of the landscape, that you're part of, part of the land. You're just like the rocks and just like the grass. And so you, you're getting your toes wet. So you're deep, deeply in it. And, and so it's to me also, and, I, and almost everything that I do, at least a good piece of it is done on plein air. And a lot of times at a lot bigger scale than most people work when they're doing plein air paintings, when they do things that are very manageable. And I often am doing things that are large and catch the wind like a sail. And I carry around a lot more stuff I could tell people to be very practical and put everything in a little box, but I don't do that. I, I do things because I like to have my whole body involved and to climb the hill and climb over the sand dunes and see what's on the other side that I, and then paint over there. So I, and I just put something up behind me that is very, very recent. My virtual painting, I just changed the one that was behind me to this painting that I just did called Horse Dreams After the Fires. Can everybody see it behind me? We um, have, I'll just go out of the share screen then, just a sec, okay? Oh. Okay, and then now, I think if I put you in. If we did, if somebody yeah. else looked at it in speaker view, they could see it bigger. So yeah. if we click on speaker view, but, but that this is the most recent thing, but, but I don't own the painting it was actually a commission that I was actually a little bit crazy to take on because I'd never painted a horse in my life. Um, but what it shows is the thing that I was just talking about, about the bones of the figure in the landscape that I've been, I've been collecting images of horses for quite a while and been very, just in photographs that I've taken and been very interested in how the shape of their backs and their bones echo the shape of the hills and the mountains in Sonoma County. And so I sort of started with that idea and, and, it's, and it was a commission. And so in Middletown, and so this was my pandemic project that when I finally decided that it was okay to leave town for this project, I like drove from Santa Rosa to Middletown without stopping and, and, and went and met all these horses and, and was introduced to them and got to know them and petted them and heard their life stories. And, and I have a whole series of drawings that, and pastels that were also done with this. And it was really good to be in, immersed in this project and, and to bring it into, so if I get out of the way, that it, it's my painting um, and, it and it's in the way that I make paintings and, there, and I invented a lot of their landscape, or I composed, it's kind of like a collage from their, from all around where they lived. So the, they weren't actually in a wildflower field, but there was one near them. And, 
and they and they carry if if you could see it at its size, which is like four feet wide, that um, that they carry the colors of the landscape in their bodies. Um, so I but, wasn't really. Marsha, don't you use ever photographs? You, because you say you took sketches, etc. You don't use photographs. In this particular one, I mixed using sketches and photographs. Right. Um, but how I painted it was really informed by the drawings and the studies that I'd done in, in pencil and pastel. And, um, and then I, did, I used some photographs to kind of find my way through to refer back to the per individual personalities of the horses. Um, because I wanted them to actually be individuals. Okay, and, cool. But um, thank you. I think yeah, that's enough probably. I think if does anyone have a question about that, or I, I feel like maybe we should move on a little bit. I was I really love it because I did think. Look, this is the time to really have a close conversation with each of you. I generally don't have the time to do that, so it's really wonderful. So I have actually still also Christy and Sherry and Elizabeth. Who wants to go for, I'm going to show your work and who wants to talk about it? Is it uh, Sherry? Okay, Sherry, I'll go to share screen a minute and I'll show your work. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Sherry. Okay, here we go. All right, we went from all these purples and greens to Grays and blues, I guess. <laughs> All these pieces of frame, that's why they look like the way they do there. I wanted to show them framed for the final product because my work is often cropped and, um, and it's work on paper, so I frame them. So um, like Serena, I never know when I'm, what it's, what's going to happen. I start somewhere. Um, sometimes it's working with a poem and it's sort of the feeling of the poem. Uh, sometimes it's just getting paper, paint, paint on paper, or since my background is in calligraphy, very often these are started with ink. So I might put water on the page to just do some ink marks like this one morning tea. Um, I just did uh, some of those circles. The, the Japanese um, Zen practice, meditation practice of, of doing Enzos, circles. I do a lot of that kind in my work. So this one was started with two circles. Some showed, some didn't. Um, lately, I've been working with some uh, gesso. So after I do some work with ink and water, I, I believe I put some gesso on this one. So some of the white background was gesso added to it. And just some abstract shapes. And and just when I see one area, I respond to it. So if it's all too curved, then I might add something straighter or just, this was, this was a different one than usual for me. And I really enjoyed uh, working on this one. So I sort of so, see it sort of as a Paul Clay-ish kind of piece with just these weird juxtapositions of things. Well, also the angles, you don't often have angles in your work. I don't often have what? Angles. An angle. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, on the lower right one is a, so some of these are new. The lower right one, all of these are actually kind of new. Uh, the lower right one is working with acrylic paint for, um, I hardly ever work with acrylic. I have chemical sensitivities and, and acrylic bothers me. So that's why I usually just stick, stick with ink and watercolor. But this one, um, I worked with acrylic gold and, and I just laid it down. There's several layers to it. That's another thing. I'm just trying to work with layers now, just kind of get the depth into the work. So I have the ink, I have the gold. And I did a lot of the gold laying with um, pieces of mat board or heavy cardboard. And so I have lines of gold. And then the flowery part is done with gesso on um, oh, a piece of wood um, and just kind of twisted it into circles. I didn't know I was making these flower images and then that's what happened. The last thing, almost the last thing I did were those leaves, the, the um, green stem, the uh, leafy kind of calligraphic mark. So it's sort of like when you add calligraphy like that, it's the mark that's either gonna make the painting or ruin it. And um, you know, I sometimes practice it many times before I do it until I'm centered enough and it's just done in one stroke. 
and then the other. And, and it's most of my paintings have this make or break thing to it. And I, I mean, if I really do something wrong, I could cover it up or crop it out, which I do a lot of, but um, I'm trying to work more with the full sheet of paper now and, and create the whole painting. So um, let's see, I think I have another couple. There's another one there with the silver. That's also a uh, silver acrylic paint. Another one, yeah, that one next to it. Um, I did that, the silver one. Yes, that one. Yeah, that also has gold on it, but I worked with um, uh, more of that gold acrylic, but then I did gesso, and then on top of that, that kind of um, misty sky is, is some gesso with some pastel on top of it. So I experiment with different things. There's some act uh, real gold leaf, it's actually silver. It's 12 karat gold, which looks like silver, but it lays better and doesn't tarnish like silver does. Um, so there was some of that. And the calligraphic mark, I, I call it uh, a semic writing. It's uh, writing without words, but it offers me the gesture and the movement of calligraphy. So I bring calligraphy into my pieces all the time, um, more so with the mark making. So I feel between the two worlds. It's like, I'm not quite a calligrapher. I, I'm not doing letters to be read, but I love the calligraphic form. And I use different tools, sometimes brushes. I think this one's a brush. Sometimes I make these folded pens um, out of like sardine can covers, uh, something that will even scratch into the paper. So I, I feel a little bit bad now because I didn't show so close for the other paintings, but you know, everyone who is watching this, you can do that for every painting, of course. You can go in there and look for every piece really, really closely like I do. So don't forget to do that. Yes. Huh? Yeah, that's a great way to show the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Because it really, as we can see, it really shows it really closely. Yes. And, oh, this one, the, the upper left, Oh, upper left here? Yeah, that one there. Um, that was started on a full sheet of 40 inch wide, 22 inch tall paper. And I just did it with all these calligraphic marks. It's actually up on my Facebook page somewhere, the original. And then I, what I look for is the story of what is going on. So just the marks themselves, these big calligraphic strokes didn't mean anything to me. And I kept working it and working it and I, I laid a piece of mulberry paper on top of it. So you could see sort of the paper and the modeling of the paper. And it's a paper with gold and silver speckles in it. So it gave me another layer to work with. And then I worked with some pastel. So a lot of this stuff is new. And then with my cropping corners, I found what to me was the story. And this was kind of during the beginning of, of the uh, racial uprising and and I felt sort of like the uh, overground, the above world, the underground world, and, and the, the clashes of our worlds. And then the calligraphic marks was sort of the, the screaming, like we, we need to be heard. There's a conversation here, or more than a conversation. But it was the, that, that strength of the calligraphic marks pulling together the, the two worlds and a little spot of gold leaf in there to kind of center it. Wow. So, um, yeah. Totally. That was Thank you. Breaking through. Mm -hmm. Breaking through, yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. I will go to Elizabeth. Here we go, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi. Um, so the reason I chose these pieces, and most of them are rather new, uh, except for the foxtail pine and the Broadway babies, um, but I wanted to show a variety um, of my work. I do a lot of pen and ink, a lot of collage, as well as the colored pencil. Um, the, um, actually the poinsettia is watercolor mostly, uh, but with some colored pencil too. Um, but uh, if you go down on the bottom there to, um, oh yeah, to the Aeonian, so sometimes plants just intrigue me and this one um, I drew the original of 
this plant about five years ago, and I planted it in my garden. And then this year during COVID, mysteriously, um, it started blooming and I, I had no idea. I had never seen anything like it. I'm still new to California plants. And I looked it up and it explained that that meant it was going to die. Uh, oh. So I felt that I, I just had to draw that first. Wow. So that was just out of my garden. Um, but then the Broadway babies um, is a good example, even though uh, the Broadway babies is the one down on the lower right. Okay, I need to go back just a second. Okay, it's a collage. And um, I've been interested in the all of you uh, talking about um, how your work develops. And for me, um, one of the reasons I so enjoy doing the collage is I start out in such an arbitrary fashion uh, with just a watercolor wash of whatever colors happen to be handy. And then I literally tear up newspaper uh, and just paste a few. This particular one, and the reason for its name was all from an article that was about children who were in Broadway plays. Um, it's an older piece, but I think it's such a good example of the thing that I do. And um, I just let it talk to me and develop. I, I never know, just as some of you were saying, what it's going to suggest. But the whole idea is to let it suggest and to let it speak to you about what it's going to be. Because I tear up newspaper and strips, and because I love trees, they're all going to be landscapes of some kind. But they incorporate different bits. And I am always looking for how to make space, how, how to create depth. Uh, and then in this one, I also did a bit of ink work. Uh, yeah, I see that here somewhere as well, right? Yeah, yeah. That just kind of. Or maybe even in the branches, yes? Uh, no, most of the branches are actually with. Um, a watercolor brush. Uh, it's called a rigger. Um, it's very long and thin and a teeny tiny tip on the end. And uh, it's what uh, I was told that uh, when I was in art school that uh, the people who drew sailboats uh, and old, you know, things with big sails, that's how they drew the sail lines and, uh, you know, from the sails. So, uh, it works very well for very teeny lines. Uh, on it. Um, and then the other example, the foxtail pine, um, is, um, if you go back to that one, uh, is a sample of the pen and ink work that I've been doing forever. Um, you know, I still do, by the way, house drawings and I so much incorporate trees into uh, the scenes with houses, uh, which are all pen and ink. But this one, uh, it's from the Sierra, and um, my doctor very kindly uh, went hiking up there and sent me pictures of these marvelous trees. I had a whole bunch of them, and uh, they just, to me, they're very dramatic and um, just perfect for pen and ink. I thought you were going to tell me that you could pay the doctor with your drawings. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. No, but she actually is a customer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Yes. Um, it's not um, often that you see people doing pen and drawing these days, right? It's not, not really uh, something that you see a lot. You see lots, I mean, not here in this area. I mean, of course, there are lots of people who do drawings, but there's not many artists who do house drawings or just pen and ink. Yeah. I just love doing it. Um, mm. it just, and to me, for some reason, with trees, it just lends itself so much to yeah. it. And uh, then the other two, the hibiscus and the echinacea, are um, colored pencil. Um, the, some of them, you know, like the hibiscus, it was a plant that had it in front of me. I drew it exactly as I saw it, and so on and so forth. The echinacea, not so much. Uh, that was a group of plants I had, uh, flowers I had seen in a trip to New York last fall. 
And um, then I just sort of put them together into a composition that seemed appropriate. Um, you know, which is one of the wonderful things about botanicals. You do have to do the tradition of uh, being very scientifically exact about the plants. The connections have to be there. The uh, way in which they grow, the way in which they, to me, move, you know, they're flowing um, and so on. In fact, at our Botanical Association, I'm told there's a lady that goes around with a uh, magnifying glass to make sure we've done all that correctly. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, I call her the botanical police. But um, but you also can have a lot of leeway in just the type of composition. There's such a huge history of botanical art all over the world. It's, yeah. It's really, it, it can get you very involved. <laughs> yeah, it is yeah. true. Right. It so, is true. Well, we have this wonderful class with Nina Ansi and many, many students follow her. And actually, I didn't know when I met you, Elizabeth, that you also did the tree drawings. It's when later on, when you entered exhibitions, that I found out about these. Uh, but I knew you for the botanical drawings. But uh, yes, you're a, a, an artist with many, many different uh, talents, right? Just like the calligraphy that like you talked about. You know, so yeah. uh, so um, thank you, Elizabeth. And we will go to Christy Marks now. And Christy, here we go. Uh, again, well, Christy has a lot of collage as well, but I see, I see a bit less here, so go for it, Christy. Okay. Well, um, I'm actually selected from a few different parts of my overall body of work to show in this event. Um, First of all, let me just start off by saying that my work is really based on everyday subject matter, either here at home or abroad. When I was living in Fresno, I, I lived in Fresno for 11 years before I moved up here to, to Santa Rosa. And I came to Fresno from Los Angeles. And when I arrived in Fresno, I was, um, upset that things were seem, seem very bleak and dusty and you know just not my bag being an Angelino woman and here I am in Fresno I was just like kind of horrified with with the whole idea of it but um, over time I became really fond of Fresno and what happened was I somehow spiritually worked my way into just seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary. And that's a very common term that you hear all the time, the extraordinary in the ordinary, but it's a common term because it's a good one. <laughs> it, mm. really, um, it, it really expresses something beautiful about the most ordinary thing. So earlier I was talking about my work on paper bags and a work like Bags on Bags Redux is a good example of that because even though that one is a little bit later work, what I started doing is just putting paper bags down on big wood panels and then seeing what I could do over it. And in this one, I literally just drew um, a whole bunch of paper bags. I just set the paper bags up on my table. I drew the paper bag with all of its uh, idiosyncrasies and tears and reflections and then grouped them all together. So these are, the piece is called Bags on Bags because it's images of paper bags on a paper bag background. But it's, it's an example of just taking the most ordinary thing, a little brown paper bag, and seeing what I could do with that. Cool, yes. I'll go back to the others. Uh -huh. Oh, two horses, Billy Blaze and Frankie. 
Now those are a little bit different. I've done horses in the past, but those two were both inspired by the Tubbs fire in 2017. Um, <clears throat> some of my friends have horses and um, some of the horses made it through the fire, but some did not make it through the fire. Mm. And the story of the ones that didn't make it through the fire um, really hit me hard. I had horses growing up as a young girl and I loved their spirit and their way and just the stories of the horses in the fire really got to me. So um, Billy Blaze is a spirit horse. And you, you can see that he has no eyes. He's very abstract. He's kind of a figment. And Frankie, uh, the other, a little bit smaller one just to the right, she is also a spirit horse, a figment, because I saw them as spirits galloping through the fire. And um, they're both on watercolor paper and they, they, they combine pen and um, uh, a, a lot of ink washes as well as acrylic paint. Beautiful, huh? You realize that you never see where that flows. It's fantastic. What was that, Catherine? You could never see work that close in real life. You know, you really have to, like the way we see your work now, so closely. Yeah, um, Billy Blaze especially is a big work. It's about um, five and a half feet in height by about 54 inches wide. So it's, it's, it's big, yeah. It's not something that um, I can really move around a whole lot in my studio, but it has a great place so that people can come and see it. Beautiful. Frankie is a smaller work. Frankie is more 36 by 24, um, beautifully framed by Max Dubois, my neighbor. Okay, these are, uh, again, a few different themes here. Uh, the first two, Prophecy and Forecast, are from a series that, of, that combines mixed media and oil paint, and they're really in celebration of the runes, casting the runes. And my, um, my hope is to eventually have six or so of these that um, um, have their casting runes from the old Nordic Viking traditions. So here what I've done is um, done a lot of collage work in, in the back. These again are on a base of paper bags and um, then drawing the um, powder horn and this wonderful burlap fabric that was draped over it and then going in um, with oil paint and really focusing on the powder horn, the runes, and the fabric to really make them the, the focal point. It's small, it's probably about, oh, it's 14, it's, 14 by 11. That is small. And then the other one that's right next to it is um, um, Prophecy. And again, it's another one with runes. And there you see the runes bags that traditionally the runes are carried carried around in the, in the old world. Yes. Okay, you want to say something about Moorings? Moorings is, Moorings is based on travel, that particular one to uh, Morocco. And again, it's a lot of mixed media with paint over it. But um, 
in Morocco, there was just a, a small neighborhood har harbor there and all these fishing boats being repaired, um, all kind of mashed up together there. So this is a piece from that, that experience. Thank you, Christy. So I'm going to, I think everyone has spoken, I've seen the work of everyone, right? So let me stop share. And um, I don't know if I've given everyone enough space. So tell me if I, if you have had not a chance to talk about something, please do now, you know? If you want me to go back and you think about something that you forgot or, you know, this is, this is the time to do it. Or if you have a question for the other artist or something that you really want to share. Yeah, Marsha, you have to unmute though. Well, you know, we talk about making different kinds of journeys. And I just wanted to mention a theme that has come up for me living in Sonoma County, um, which is the theme of the iconic mountain. And so Mount St. Helena to me is our iconic mountain. And in some of my work um, that you see on, that, I've sh that I'm showing, there's Mount St. Helena. Um, I, I regard Mount St. Helena as, um, as a qu queen. And, and, it's, and I realized as I spent a lot of time there and kept journals there in Pepperwood that other artists have had their iconic mountains like Georgia O'Keeffe had her Padernal. And when I traveled to New Mexico the first time with Sally, who I just saw popping up there, when we found a place where you could see just this view of the Padernal, we decided that must be Georgia's house when nobody was telling us where it was. Um, and there was the tradition of Mount Fuji for the Japanese um, painters, Hir Hiroshigi, um, especially who made a hundred views of Mount Fuji. And um, for Cezanne, um, his, his mountain in, um, in Provence that he painted hundreds of times. And there gets to be certain kinds of places that maybe become part of our own spirit. And there's certainly places like that that are spiritual in um, Australia also, um, that there's certain, there's a kind of power in it and, and a kind of settling. So to me, when I travel around and then I get this view again of Mount St. Helena, it's like, oh yes, that's my mountain. And of course, many of us may think that also um, about Mount Tamalpais, you know, that there's, that there's something in, of the heart and the spirit in, us in, in these images, then we become part of the land. And I think that the land really speaks and, and, and it also brings to mind when I've taken a lot of people out on different land, for land trust places and also special places in New Mexico um, and, in, and in Mexico. And I remember a student of mine saying that she believed that rocks were alive and that they spoke and that there was, there's a, like, there's a force that is not embodied in people or in animals that is still there. And if we just with it and pay attention, we can be nurtured by it and nurture it. And the land needs so much nurturing from us right now. That is true, Marsha, but you are obviously are also a plein air artist. So, but you know this sacred place, I'm sure that uh, every artist here has this other, this other sacred place to be and to work from. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, and, I, and, and that would be great to hear as well where, where that is for the other artists. Uh, I can definitely see that for you. But is any other artist that feel that recognition, but maybe in a different way? I think for me, it would be the ocean. I, uh, I paint the ocean a lot and uh, I, it, the colors and the rhythms of it appear a lot in my abstractions. So it's, uh, I, I, it's, it's great, you know, there's a sense of breathing and uh, yeah, so I, I would say that was, that was mine. And when I'm not drawn to the mountains, I'm drawn to the ocean too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. I tend to like to work with 
the above world and the underground world. So I, I'm a gardener from years back and always paying attention to the roots. So it's not a particular place I go to, but that's where I find the depth, the, the psychological work, the shamanism, that kind of underground reaching that comes up in my paintings a lot. Mm. Yeah. I'm a uh, ocean bi-coastal. I spent all my summers as until I was 16, 17, barefoot in the fog on the coast of Maine and with a community that was on four dirt roads at the end of a peninsula. And I was a wild child and um, I never lost that. And it kind of kept my spirit alive to be in, you know, cold, cold, cold water, wait till my ankles froze, and then I knew it was, I was acclimated and could dive in, and just, I spent hours by myself, and, you know, psychological stuff. Years later, I discovered I was actually kind of very lonely and sort of whatever, but I had this incredible land, and, um, and then my family skied and took me to these incredible places that were way above tree line. And, and I had terrors there, I was in an avalanche. So I had this mix of these both uh, visual intense beauty and then also this reverence and fear of the potency of nature. And I also felt when I came to California, which I came when I was nine, and I always feel like my family moved here for me. They all moved back to New the East Coast, and I ended up, you know, going east and then coming back here. And I felt like a little person in a big landscape, and then I felt like I could breathe. It was like all this energy that's in my body, this, this landscape, this big landscape could actually handle it. And... So there's something that's very much for me, uh, you know, it's just cellular, it's in my work. Yeah. Well, you are also privileged to realize that, right? Because you have a way of expressing yourself and to use what's inside, what's outside and bring something so beautiful that you can share with others. I've heard a number of artists saying, when there is the pandemic, well, they actually, did, it's terrible, of course. I mean, there's a lot of, there are, there's, there's a lot happening, but you know, they're perfectly fine in the studio. You know, they're, they're perfectly happy to be working in the studio and do their work and, you know, create and paint and, you know, calligraphy and just make things out there. So, you know, is that something that you can share? I mean, I mean, we all have daily things to do, but are you, I think you, if you could just create all day long, you would just be happy, don't you think? Yeah, Elizabeth. Well, I, I think that's just one of the things about being an artist. You're used to being alone and actually enjoy that time. Uh, it's your freedom to be doing the stuff that you love. Um, I, w I was thinking about what people were saying about their having favorite places and whatever. And I, in a very broad sense, I guess I just consider myself a coastal person that I grew up on the East Coast. Well, I grew up in New York City in Queens. Um, and now I've come here to California. And I, I just like being near a coast, <laughs> I think. <laughs> One way or the other, it's somehow. Uh, and you know, the other thing about Northern California that I love compared to Southern California is the trees. Because um, we have wonderful trees on the East Coast. But I've gotten to know very marvelous trees, of course, out here. I just drew a sequoia, in fact. Very nice, very nice. I find that the really, the small kind of um, inconsequential interactions that are what keep me feeling connected in a lifestyle where I already spend a tremendous amount of time by myself and I don't have a partner, so I'm also alone when I'm home. And the, that those non-consequential interactions that are now gone have really left a kind of vacancy of loneliness 
that has filtered into my studio and made me really question like you know, what do I what am I doing and why do I do this because the the engagement um, is really gone it's not just a little gone it's really gone and mm -hmm. that um, I you know that, that that's a that's a part of my daily, you know, talking with a Rosa who delivers my mail for 20 minutes or, you know, running into one person that I know and having this wonderful conversation for 15 minutes and hug, nice to see you and gone. That's, it's bizarre. It is. A, a time of separation is very strange. The, the, the way that things that we get separated is different but it will not be forever like that it will not be forever it will not be forever so it will change so is any one of you uh, are you opening your studio this weekend are you open so not only but so first of all are you are you are uh, talking to people on the phone are you will will you invite people to come to your studio or by appointment what is your plan I'm um, about to send an email out to my um, email list and I mentioned it initially with them and say that I'll take appointments um, because I'm in a collective studio building and out of respect for the other artists, I'm not going to uh, open it up completely. So I'm doing appointments for the next two weeks. I'm doing appointments as well. I'm not real comfortable with uh, just opening up and having people come in, um, but I do have an open air space, and so uh, you know, I think it's fairly safe with, with uh, you know, typical precautions. Yes, if people are careful, it should be okay to put it outside. That means if we don't have a terrible heat wave, or if we can breathe, of course. But I think this coming weekend should be fine. How about you, Elizabeth? Um, I have not opened, uh, you know, at all. But um, I will do another email. I've invited people to go to my website. I put a store on my website. Um, and, um, you know, I can make arrangements to peop have people come here to pick up work they, they purchased. Actually, most of what I, I've sold, um, in, you know, since COVID started, um, has fortunately been stuff I could ship, um, so uh, hasn't been really much of a problem. Right. And you, Marsha? I really can't invite people into my space. Um, okay. I have invited people by email to um, contact me, and I'll be happy to guide them on a virtual tour. Yeah. Um, of my website and to send them other images um, and that they can come by appointment. But when they come by appointment, I'm only going to meet them outside with a particular thing or two or three that they would like to see, but I'm not set up for visitors. <laughs> but I think that's a great way to deal with it. And honestly, we just saw how easy it is to show on the website. You know, people can zoom in so well. I mean, today, I mean, the, I think the website is absolutely wonderful. And if people use it to, to, you know, to do as much as they can, it has a lot of potential. You can do a lot. And if then you can invite people outside to see two or three pieces, that should be really a good solution in these days. In these well, days. That, that's my hope. And, and yeah. oh, I've said that I will be open by appointment, but when it comes to somebody wanting an appointment, that's the kind of appointment we're going to have. Yes. Well, yeah. I haven't heard from Christy or from Sherry. So that, uh, Sherry is unmuted, so I, I'll listen to Sherry first. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing or have been doing the same thing as Marsha. Mostly I'm doing online. I just spent a month updating my uh, art and poetry website. And um, so I'll just be doing mailings and, and, um, and that. But if anyone wants to see a particular painting, I will bring it outside if they contact me. Great. Mm -hmm. And Christy, you prepared your studio, obviously. You have to unmute yourself. 
not there yet. Yes. Okay. Yes, I was open the first two weekends of the month and um, had some people, although especially the first weekend, it was so hot. Um, people did come by in the morning, but the afternoon was, you know, it was just too, too hot outside. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do for the balance of the event now is just to send out another email thanking people for coming by the first two weekends and just inviting them to um, call and make an appointment if they'd like to see something else or if there's something on the website that they would like to see. It's um, in my studio. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, if there is, if you have anything else, I mean, I would like to mention, I, I'm going to be doing a demo of my work on Sunday uh, from 1 to 2 o'clock. It'll be announced um, on the website or where, wherever you're announcing that. I'll be announcing it too. So I'll talk about the tools I use, the, uh, the paper. I'll be starting a painting. I don't know how finished I'll get with it, but I will be showing my techniques. So I invite that's, people to join me for that. That's great. That is great. At one o'clock, you said, say the time. One o'clock on Sunday, the twentieth. Yeah. Perfect. And we can. How can we do? How can we see that today? Will we be able to go on the on the site and then? Yep. If you go to the Subarts Virtual website, um, up in the menu under events, you'll find the listing for Sherry's demo. And I haven't put a link up there yet for the Zoom. I guess I'm supposed to. Um. Yeah. Just send it to me, and I'll add it. Uh huh. Okay. I'll get that done. Thanks. Good. Well, that's a good idea, right? That's, well, you still have till the end of the month, if you can. That's a great idea. So, yeah, totally. Well, I want to thank you very much. Um, as you know, I mean, you're all artists that I admire very much. So it was a great privilege for me to talk to you, all of you, and to hear your, your own point of view, and to be able to talk a little bit more about your work. So um, I wish you two really great weekends. And actually, what I'm saying, you know, you could actually take day and night, you could, you could have conversations with people. It's not only the weekend, right? I mean, any time, any time you can talk to people. So don't forget that. I mean, if you say, well, it's only on Saturday or Sunday, but actually any time before 10 o'clock at night, I presume, you know, people could contact you and try to talk to you about your work. So um, unless there is anything you want to add to this right now, now is the moment. Any, yeah, anything you want to say for the people on Thursday, you know, who will have to do their, um, their talk? Any advice or no? You're fine? Then I'll, then, say good, then I'll say goodbye. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Catherine. Catherine. Bye bye. Take care. Talk to all of you. Great care, okay? And I'll speak to you soon. Bye bye. bye.